Part 3 Chapter 75 Clara was milking a mare when Sally, her oldest girl, came racing down the lot. Somebody's coming, Ma, Sally said, excitement in her face. Sally was ten years old and sociable. She loved visitors. The young mare had dropped her foal early, and the colt was too weak to stand up, which was why she was milking. The colt would suck milk off a rag, and Clara was determined to save it if she could. Good. When Sally ran up, the mare flinched, causing Clara to squirt a stream of milk along her own arm. Haven't I told you to walk up to horses, Clara said. She stood up and wiped the milk off her dripping arm. I'm sorry, Ma, Sally said, more excited than ever. See, there's a wagon coming. Then Betsy, only seven, came flying out of the house her brown hair streaming, and raced down to the corrals. Betsy liked company as much as her sister. "'Who's coming?' she asked. The wagon was barely visible, coming along the plat from the west. "'I thought I told you girls to churn,' Clara said. "'Seems like all you do is hang out in the window watching for travelers.' Of course no one could blame them, for company was rare. They lived twenty miles from town, and a bad town at that, Ogallala, if they went in, it was usually for church, but they seldom made the trip. Their company mostly consisted of men who came to trade horses with Bob, her husband, and now that he was injured, few came. They had just as many horses, more, in fact, and Clara knew more about them than Bob had ever learned, but there were few men disposed to bargain with a woman, and Clara was not disposed to give their horses away. When she named a price, she meant it but usually men got their backs up and wouldn't buy. I expect they're just buffalo hunters, Clara said, watching the distant wagon creep over the brown plains. You girls won't learn much from them, unless you're interested in learning how to spit tobacco. I ain't, Betsy said. You aren't, you mean, Sally said. I thought all the buffalo were dead. How come they still hunt them? Because people are slow learners, like your sister. Clara said, grinning at Betsy to mitigate the criticism. Are you going to invite them for the night? Sally asked. Want me to kill a hen? Not just yet. They may not be in the mood to stop, Clara said. Besides, you and I don't agree about hens. You might kill one of the ones I like. Mother, they're just to eat, Sally said. Nope. I keep those hens to talk to me when I'm lonesome, Clara said. I'll only eat the ones who can't make good conversation. Betsy wrinkled up her nose, amused by the comment. Oh, Ma, she said. Hens don't talk. They talk, Clara said. You just don't understand hen talk. I'm an old hen myself, and it makes good sense to me. You ain't old, Ma, Sally said. That wagon won't be here for an hour, Clara said. Go see about your pa. His fever comes up in the afternoon, wet a rag, and wipe his face. Both girls stood looking at her silently. They hated to go into the sick room. Both of them had bright blue eyes, their legacy from Bob, but their hair was like hers, and they were built like her, even to the knobby knees. Bob had been kicked in the head by a Mustang he was determined to break, against Clara's advice. She had seen it happen. He had the mare snubbed to a post with a heavy rope and only turned his back on her for a second. But the mare struck with her front feet, quick as a snake, Bob had bent over to pick up another rope, and the kick had caught him right back of the ear. The crack had sounded like a shot. The mare pawed him three or four times before Clara could reach him and drag him out of the way, but those blows had been minor. The kick behind the ear had almost killed him. They had been so sure he would die that they even dug the grave. Up on the knoll east of the house, where their three boys were buried, Jim and Jeff and Johnny, the three deaths Clara felt had turned her heart to stone. She hoped for stone, anyway, for stone wouldn't suffer from such losses. Bob, though, hadn't died. Neither had he recovered. His eyes were open, but he could neither speak nor move. He could swallow soup if his head was tilted a certain way, and it was chicken broth that had kept him alive the three months since his accident. He simply lay staring up with his large blue eyes, feverish sometimes, but mostly as still as if he were dead. He was a large man, over two hundred pounds, and it took all her strength to move him and clean him every day. 
He had no control over bowels or bladder. Day after day, Clara removed the soiled bedclothes, stuffing them in a wash tub she filled beforehand from a cistern. She never let the girls see or help with the operation. She supposed Bob would die in time, and she didn't want his daughters to feel disgust for him, if she could prevent it. She only sent them in once a day to bathe his face, hoping that the sight of them would bring him out of his state. Is Daddy going to die? Betsy often asked. She'd only been one when Johnny, her last brother, had died and had no memories of death, just a great curiosity about it. I don't know, Betsy, Clara said. I don't know at all. I hope not. Well, but can he ever talk again? Sally asked. His eyes are open. Why can't he talk? His head is hurt, Clara said. It's hurt on the inside. Maybe it'll heal if we take care of him, and then he can talk again. Do you think he can hear the piano when I play? Betsy asked. Just go and bathe his face, please. I don't know what he can hear, she said. She felt as if a flood of tears might come at any moment, and she didn't want the girls to see them. The piano, over which she and Bob had argued for two years, had come the week before his accident. It had been her victory, but a sad one. She had ordered it all the way from St. Louis, and it had been woefully out of tune when it finally came, but there was a Frenchman who played the piano in a saloon in town who tuned it for her for five dollars. And although she assumed it was a whorehouse he played the piano in, she hired him at the big fee of two dollars a week, to ride out and give her daughters lessons. The Frenchman's name was Jules. He was really a French-Canadian who had been a traitor on the Red River of the North and had gone broke when smallpox hit the tribes. He had wandered down through the Dakotas to Ogallala and turned to music for a living. He loved to come out and teach the girls. He said they reminded him of the cousins he had once played with in his grandmother's house in Montreal. He wore a black coat when he came and waxed his mustache. Both girls thought he was the most refined man they had ever seen, and he was. Clara had bought the piano with money saved all those years from the sale of her parents' little business in Texas. She had never let Bob use the money, another bone of contention between them. She wanted it for her children, so when the time came they could be sent away to school and not have to spend their whole youth in such a raw, lonely place. The first of the money she spent on the two-story frame house they had built three years before, after nearly fifteen years of life in the sod house Bob had dug for her on a slope above the plat. Clara had always hated the sod house, hated the dirt that seeped down on her bedclothes year after year. It was dust that caused her firstborn Jim to cough virtually from his birth until he died a year later. In the mornings, Claire would walk down and wash her hair in the icy waters of the plat, and yet by supper time, if she happened to scratch her head, her fingernails would fill with dirt that had seeped down during the day. For some reason, no matter where she moved her bed, the roof would trickle dirt right onto it. She tacked muslin and finally canvas on the ceiling over the bed, but nothing stopped the dirt for long. It sifted through. It seemed to her that all her children had been conceived in dust clouds, dust rising from the bedclothes or sifting down from the ceiling. Centipedes and other bugs loved the roof. Day after day they crawled down the walls to end up in her stew pots or her skillets or the trunks where she stored her clothes. I'd rather live in a teepee like an Indian, she told Bob many times. I'd be cleaner. When it got dirty, we could burn it. The idea had shocked Bob. A conventional man, if there ever was one. He could not believe he had married a woman who wanted to live like an Indian. He worked hard to give her a respectable life. And yet, she said things like that, and meant them. And she stubbornly kept her own money, year after year, for the children's education, she said, although one by one the three boys died long before they were old enough to be sent anywhere. The last two lived long enough for Clara to teach them to read. She had read them Walter Scott's Ivanhoe when Jeff and Johnny were six and seven, respectively. Then, the next winter, both boys had died of pneumonia within a month of one another. It was a terrible winter, the ground frozen so deep that there was no way to dig a grave. They had to put the boys in the little kindling shed 
wrapped tightly in wagon sheets until winter let up enough that they could be buried. Many days, Bob would come home from delivering horses to the army, his main customer, to find Clara sitting in the icy shed by the two small bodies, tears frozen on her cheeks so hard that he would have to heat water and bathe the ice from her face. He tried to point out to her that she mustn't do it. The weather was below zero, and the wind swept endlessly along the plat. She could freeze to death, sitting in the kindling shed. If only I would, Clara thought, I'd be with my boys. But she didn't freeze, and Jeff and Johnny had been buried beside Jim, and despite her resolve never to lay herself open to such heartbreak again, she had the girls, neither of whom had ever had more than a cold. Bob couldn't believe his own bad luck. He longed for a strong boy or two to help him with the stock. And yet he loved the girls in his unspeaking way. His love mostly came out in his awkwardness, for their delicacy frightened him. He was continually warning them about their health and trying to keep them wrapped up. Their recklessness almost stopped his heart at times, and they were the kind of girls who would run out in the snow barefoot if they chose. He feared for them, and also feared the effect on his wife if one of them should die. Impervious to weather himself, he came to dread the winters for fear winter would take the rest of his family. Yet the girls proved as strong as their mother, whereas the boys had all been weak. It made no sense to Bob, and he was hoping if they could only have another boy, he would turn into the helper he needed. The only hand they had was an old Mexican cowboy named Cholo. The old man was wiry and strong, despite his age, and stayed mainly because of his devotion to Clara. It was Cholo and not her husband who taught her to love horses and to understand them. Cholo had pointed out to her once that her husband would never break the Mustang mare. He had urged her to persuade Bob to sell the mare, unbroken, or else let her go. Though Bob had been a horse trader all his adult life, he had no real skill with horses. If they disobeyed him, he beat them. Clara had often turned her back in disgust from the sight of her husband beating a horse, for she knew it was his incompetence, not the horses, that was to blame for whatever incident had provoked the beating. Bob could not contain his violence when angered by a horse. With her, it was different. He had never raised a hand to her, though she provoked him often and deeply. Perhaps it was because he had never quite believed that she would marry him, or never quite understood why she had. The shadow of Augustus McRae had hung over their courtship, Bob had never known why she chose him over the famous ranger, or over any of the other men she could have had. In her day, she had been the most sought-after girl in Texas, and yet she had married him, and followed him to the Nebraska Plains, and stayed and worked beside him. It was hard country for women. Bob knew that. Women died, went crazy, or left. The wife of their nearest neighbor, Maud Jones, had killed herself with a shotgun one morning, leaving a note which merely said, Can't stand listening to this wind no more. Maud had had a husband and four children, but had killed herself anyway. For a time, Clara had taken in the children until their grandparents in Missouri came for them. Len Jones, Maud's husband, soon drank himself into poverty. He fell out of his wagon, drunk one night, and froze to death not two hundred yards from a saloon. Clara had lived and stayed, though she had a look in her gray eyes that frightened Bob every time he saw it. He didn't really know what the look meant, but to him it meant she might leave if he didn't watch out. When they first came to Nebraska, he had had the drinking habit. Ogallala was hardly even a town then. There were few neighbors and almost no socials. The Indians were a dire threat, though Clara didn't seem to fear them. If they had company, it was usually soldiers. The soldiers drank, and so did he. Clara didn't like it. One night he got pretty drunk, and when he got up in the morning, she had that look in her eye. She made him breakfast, but then she looked at him coldly and lay down a threat. I want you to stop drinking, she said. You've been drunk three times this week. I won't live here and get dirt in my hair for the love of a drunkard. It was the only threat she ever had to make. Bob spent the day worrying, looking at the bleak plains and wondering what he would do in such a place without her. He never touched whiskey again. 
The jug he had been working on sat in the cupboard for years until Clara finally mixed it with sorghum molasses and used it for cough medicine. They had few quarrels, most of them about money. Clara was a good wife and worked hard. She never did anything untoward or unrespectable, and yet the fact that she had that Texas money made Bob uneasy. She wouldn't give it up or let him use it, no matter how poor they were. Not that she spent it on herself. Clara spent nothing on herself, except for the books she ordered or the magazines she took. She kept the money for her children, she said. But Bob could never be sure she wasn't keeping it, so she could leave if she took a notion. He knew it was foolish. Clara would leave, money or no money, if she decided to go, but he couldn't get the idea out of his mind. She wouldn't even use the money on the house, although she had wanted the house, and they had had to haul the timber 200 miles. Of course, he had prospered in the horse business, mainly because of the army trade. He could afford to build her a house, but he still resented her money. She told him it was only for the girls' education, and yet she did things with it he didn't expect. The winter before, she had bought Cholo a buffalo coat, an action which shocked Bob. He had never heard of a married woman buying a Mexican cowboy an expensive coat. Then there was the piano. She had ordered that, too, although it cost $200 and another 40 to transport. And yet, he had to admit, he loved to see his girls sitting at the piano trying to learn their fingering. And the buffalo coat had saved Cholo's life when he was trapped in an April blizzard up on the Dismal River. Clara got her way, and her way often turned out to make sense. And yet Bob more and more felt that her way skipped him somehow. She didn't neglect him in any way that he could put his finger on, and the girls loved him, but there were many times when he felt left out of the life of his own family. He would never have said that to Clara, he was not good with words and seldom spoke unless he was spoken to, unless it was about business. Watching his wife, he often felt lonely. Clara seemed to sense it and would usually come and try to be especially nice to him or to get him laughing at something the girls had done. And yet he still felt lonely, even in their bed. Now Bob lay in that bed all day, staring his empty stare. They had moved the bed near the window so that he would get the summer breezes and could look out if he liked and watch his horses grazing on the plain or the hawks circling or whatever little sights there might be. But Bob never turned his head and no one knew if he felt the breezes. Clara had taken to sleeping on a little cot. The house had a small upper porch and she moved the cot out there in good weather. Often she lay awake, listening, half expecting Bob to come back to himself and call her. More often, what happened was that he fouled himself, and instead of hearing him, she would smell him. Even so, she was glad it happened at night, so that she could change him without the girls seeing. It seemed to her, after a month of it, that she was carrying Bob away with those sheets. He'd already lost much weight, and every morning seemed a little thinner to her. The large body that had lain beside her so many nights, that had warmed her in the icy nights, that had covered her those many times through the years and given her five children was dribbling away as awful. And yet there was nothing she could do about it. The doctors in Ogallala said Bob's skull was fractured. You couldn't put a splint on a skull. Probably he'd die. And yet he wasn't dead. Often, when she was cleaning him, bathing his soiled loins and thighs with warm water, the stem of life between his legs would raise itself, growing as if a fractured skull meant nothing to it. Clara cried at the sight. What it meant to her was that Bob still hoped for a boy. He couldn't talk or turn himself, and he would never beat another horse, most likely, but he still wanted a boy. The stem let her know it, night after night when all she came in to do was clean the stains from a dying body. She would roll Bob on his side and hold him there for a while, for his back and legs were developing terrible bed sores. She was afraid to turn him on his belly for fear he might suffocate, but she would hold him on his side for an hour, sometimes napping as she held him. Then she would roll him back and cover him and go back to her cot, often to lie awake half the night looking at the prairies, sad beyond tears the way of things. There Bob lay, barely alive, his ribs showing more every morning, 
still wanting a boy. I could do it, she thought. Would it save him if I did? I could go through it one more time. The pregnancy, the fear, the sore nipples, the worry, and maybe it would be a boy. Though she had borne five children, she sometimes felt barren, lying on her cot at night. She felt she was ignoring her husband's last wish, that if she had any generosity, she would do it for him. How could she lie there night after night and ignore the strange, mute urgings of a dying man, one who had never been anything but kind to her in his clumsy way? Bob, dying, still wanted her to make a little Bob. Sometimes in the long, silent nights, she felt she must be going crazy to think about such things in such a way, and yet she came to dread having to go to him at night. It became as hard as anything she had to do in her marriage. It was so hard that at times she wished Bob would go on and die if he couldn't get well. The truth was, she didn't want another child, particularly not another boy. Somehow she felt confident she could keep her girls alive, but she lacked that confidence where boys were concerned. She remembered too well the days of icy terror and restless pain as she listened to Jim cough his way to death. She remembered her hatred of and helplessness before, the fevers that had taken Jeff and Johnny. Not again, she thought. I won't live that again, even for you, Bob. The memory of the fear that had torn her as her children approached death was the most vivid of her life. She could remember the coughings, the painful breathing. She never wanted to listen helplessly to such again. Besides, Bob wasn't really alive, even then. His eyes never flickered. It was only reflex that enabled him to swallow the soup she fed him. That his rod still seemed to live when she bathed him, that too was reflex, an obscene joke that life was playing on the two of them. It raised no feelings of tenderness in her, just a feeling of disgust at the cruelties of existence. It seemed to mock her, to make her feel that she was cheating Bob of something, though it was not easy to say what. She had married him, followed him, fed him, worked beside him, borne his children, and yet, even as she changed his sheets, she felt there was a selfishness in her that she had never mastered. Something had been held back. What it was, considering all that she had done, was hard to say. But she felt it anyway, fair judgment or not, and lay awake on her cot through half the night, tense with self-reproach. In the mornings, she lay wrapped in a quilt until the smell of Cholo's coffee waked her, she had fallen into the habit of letting Cholo make the coffee, mainly because he was better at it than she was. She would lie in her quilt, watching the mists float over the plat, until one or both of the girls tiptoed out. They always tiptoed, as if they might wake their father, though his eyes were as wide open as ever. Ma, ain't you up? Sally would say. We have been up a while. Want to gather the eggs? Betsy asked. It was her favorite chore, but she preferred to do it with her mother. Some of the hens were irritable with Betsy, and would peck her if she tried to slide an egg out from under them, whereas they would never peck Clara. I'd rather gather you two, Clara said, pulling both girls onto the cot with her, with the sunlight flooding the wide plain and both her two girls in bed with her. It was hard to feel as bad about herself as she had felt alone in the night. Don't you want to get up? Sally asked. She had more of her father in her than Betsy had, and it bothered her a little to see her mother lazing in bed with the sun up. It seemed to her a little wrong, at least. Her father had often complained about it. Oh, shush, Clara said. The sun's just been up five minutes. She reflected that perhaps that was what she had held back. She had never become proficient at early rising, despite all the practice she'd had. She had got up dutifully and made breakfast for Bob and whatever hands happened to be there, but she was not at her best, and the breakfast seldom arrived on the table in the orderly fashion that Bob expected. It was a relief to her when he went away on horse trading expeditions and she could sleep late or just lie in bed thinking and reading the magazine she ordered from the East or from England. The ladies' magazines had stories and parts of novels in them, in many of which were ladies who led lives so different from hers that she felt she might as well be on another planet. She liked Thackeray's ladies better than Dickens's, and George Eliot's best of all, but it was a frustration that the mail came so seldom. 
Sometimes she would have to wait for two or three months for her Blackwoods, wondering all the time what was happening to the people in the stories. Reading stories by all the women, not only George Eliot, but Mrs. Gore and Mrs. Gaskell and Charlotte Young, she sometimes had a longing to do what those women did, write stories. But those women lived in cities or towns and had many friends and relatives nearby. It discouraged her to look out the window at the empty plains and reflect that even if she had the eloquence to write and the time, she had nothing to write about. With Maud Jones dead, she seldom saw another woman and had no relatives near except her husband and her children. There was an aunt in Cincinnati, but they only exchanged letters once or twice a year. Her characters would have to be the horses and the hens, if she ever wrote, for the men folk that came by weren't interesting enough to put in the books, it seemed to her. None of them were capable of the kind of talk men managed in English novels. She longed sometimes to talk to a person who actually wrote stories and had them printed in magazines. It interested her to speculate how it was done, whether they used people they knew or just made people up. Once, she had even ordered some big writing tablets, thinking she might try it anyway, even if she didn't know how. But that was in the hopeful years before her boys died. With all the work that had to be done, she never actually sat down and tried to write anything. And the boys died and her feeling changed. Once, the sight of the writing tablets had made her hopeful. But after those deaths, it ceased to matter. The tablets were just another reproach to her, something willful she had wanted. She burned the tablets one day, trembling with anger and pain, as if the paper and not the weather had been somehow responsible for the death of her boys. And for a time, she stopped reading the magazines. The stories in them seemed hateful to her. How could people talk that way and spend their time going to balls and parties when children died and had to be buried? But a few years had passed, and Clara went back to the stories in the magazines. She loved to read aloud and she read snatches of them to her daughters as soon as they were big enough to listen. Bob didn't particularly like it, but he tolerated it. No other woman he knew read as much as his wife, and he thought it might be the cause of certain of her vanities. The care she took with her hair, for instance, washing it every day and brushing it, to him it seemed like a waste. Hair was just hair. As Clara watched the wagon, the girls had spotted drawing closer. She saw Cholo come riding in with two mares who were ready to foal. Cholo had seen the wagon, too, and had come to look after her. He was a cautious old man, as puzzled by Clara as he was devoted to her. It was her recklessness that disturbed him. She was respectful of dangerous horses, but seemed to have no fear at all of dangerous men. She laughed when Cholo tried to counsel her. She was not even afraid of the Indians, though Cholo had showed her the scars of the arrow wounds he had suffered. Now he penned the mares and loped over to be sure she wasn't threatened by whoever was coming in the wagon. They kept a shotgun in the saddle shed, but Claire only used it to kill snakes, and she only killed snakes because they were always stealing her eggs. At times the hens seemed to her almost more trouble than they were worth, for they had to be protected constantly from coyotes, skunks, badgers, even hawks and eagles. I don't see but two men, Cholo, Clara said, watching the wagon. Two men is too too many. If they are bad men, Cholo said. Bad men would have a better team, Clara said. Find any colts? Cholo shook his head. His hair was white. Clara had never been able to get his age out of him, but she imagined he was 75 at least, perhaps 80. At night by the fire, with the work done, Cholo wove horsehair lariats. Clara loved to watch the way his fingers worked. When a horse died or had to be killed, Cholo always saved its mane and tail for his ropes. He could weave them of rawhide, too, and once had made one for her of buckskin, although she didn't rope. Bob had been puzzled by the gift. Clara couldn't rope a post, he said, but Clara was not puzzled at all. She had been very pleased. It was a beautiful gift. Cholo had the finest manners. She knew he appreciated her as she appreciated him. That was the year she had bought him the coat. Sometimes, reading her magazines, she would look up and see Cholo weaving a rope and imagine that if she ever did try to write a story, she would write it about him. It would be very different from any of the stories she read in the English magazines. Cholo was not much like an English gentleman, but it was his gentleness and skill with horses, in contrast to Bob's incompetence, 
and made her want badly to encourage him to stay with him. He talked little, which would be a problem if she put him in a story. The people in the stories she read seemed to talk a great deal. He had been stolen as a child by Comanches, and had gradually worked his way north, traded from one tribe to another, until he had escaped one day during a battle. Though he was an old man and lived among Indians and whites his whole life, he still preferred to speak Spanish. Clara knew a little from her girlhood in Texas and tried to speak it with him. At the sound of the Spanish words, his wrinkled face would light up with happiness. Clara persuaded him to teach her girls. Cholo couldn't read, but he was a good teacher anyway. He loved the girls and would take them on rides, pointing at things and giving them their Spanish names. Soon all the mares in the corral were pricking their ears and watching the approaching wagon. A big man in a coat heavier than Cholo's rode beside it on a little brown horse that looked as if it would drop if it had to carry him much farther. A man with a badly scarred face rode on the wagon seat, beside him a woman who was heavy with child. The woman drove the team. All three looked so blank with exhaustion that even the sight of people, after what must have been a long journey, didn't excite them much. A few buffalo hides were piled in the wagon. Cholo watched the travelers carefully, but they didn't seem to pose a threat. The woman drew the rein and looked down at them as if dazed. Are we to Nebraska yet? she asked. Yes, Clara said. It's nearly twenty miles to town. Won't you get down and rest? Do you know D. Boot? the woman said. I'm looking for him. See, si. Estilero, Cholo said quietly. He did most of their shopping and knew practically everyone in Ogallala. Elmira heard the word and knew what it meant. But she didn't care what anybody called D. The fact that he was nearby was all that mattered. If D was near, it meant that she was safe and could soon be rid of Luke and Big's way and not have to ride on the jolting wagon seat all day or be scared all night that they would run into Indians at the last minute. Get down. At least you'll want to water your stock, Clara said. You're welcome to stay the night if you like. You can easily make town tomorrow. I'd say you could all use a rest. What time would that be? Luke asked, easing down from the wagon seat. He had twisted a leg several days before, running to try to get a better shot at an antelope. It was all he could do to walk. Elmira didn't want to stop, even when she told that it was still over half a day to Ogallala, but Zway had already dismounted and unhitched the horses. I wish I could get to D, she thought, but then decided one more day wouldn't matter. She got slowly down from the wagon seat. Come on up to the house, Clara said. I'll have the girls draw some water. Guess you've come a ways. Arkansas, Elmira said. The house didn't look very far away, but as they walked toward it, it seemed to wobble in her vision. My goodness, that is a ways, Clara said. I lived in Texas once, and then she turned and saw that the woman was sitting on the ground. Before Clara could reach her, she had toppled sideways and laid face up on the trail that led from the house to the barn. Clara was not too alarmed, just tired, she thought. A journey all the way from Arkansas on a wagon like that would wear anybody out. She fanned the woman's face for a while, but it did no good. Cholo had seen the woman fall and ran to her, but the big man lifted the woman as easily as if she were a child and carried her to the house. I didn't get your name, or your name, either, Clara said. The big man just looked at her silently. Was he mute? Clara thought. But later the man with a scarred face came to the house and said no, the big man just didn't talk much. Name's Way, he said. Big's Way. I'm Luke. I got my face bunged up coming, and now I hurt this darn leg. Her name's Elmira. And she's a friend of Mr. Boot? Clara asked. They put Elmira in bed, but she hadn't yet opened her eyes. Don't know about that. She's married to a sheriff, Luke said. He felt uncomfortable in the house after so many days outside, and soon went out to sit on the wagon with Zway. He happened to look up and see the two girls peering at him from an open window. He wondered where the man was, for surely the good-looking woman he had talked to couldn't be married to the old Mexican. That night, she asked if they would like to come in and eat supper. Zway wouldn't, he was too shy, so the woman brought their suppers out and they ate in the wagon. The girls were disappointed at that turn of events. They seldom had company and wanted a better look at the men. Make them come in, Ma, 
Sally whispered. She was particularly fascinated by the one with the scarred face. I can't just order men around, Clara said. Anyway, you've met buffalo hunters before. Smelled them, too. These don't smell much different from any of the others. One of them's big, Betsy observed. Is he the lady's husband? I don't think so. And don't be a busybody, Clara said. She's worn out. Maybe tomorrow she'll feel like talking. But the girls were to hear Elmira's voice long before morning. The men sitting in the wagon heard it, too. Long screams that raked the prairie night for hours. Once again, Clara had reason to be glad of Cholo, who was as good with women as he was with horses. Difficult births didn't frighten him as they did most men, and many women. Elmira's was difficult, too. The exhausting journey over the plains had left her too weak for the task at hand. She fainted many times during the night. Clara could do nothing about it except bathe her face with cool water from the cistern. When day came, Elmira was too weak to scream. Clara was worried. The woman had lost too much blood. Mama, Daddy's sick. He smells bad, Sally said, peeking for a moment into the sick room. The girls had slept downstairs on pallets so as to be farther from the screams. Just leave him be. I'll take care of him, Clara said. But he's sick. He smells bad, Sally repeated. Her eyes were fearful. He's alive. Life don't always smell nice, Clara said. Go make us some breakfast and take some to those men. They must be hungry. A few minutes later, Elmira fainted again. She's too weak, Jolo said. Poor thing, Clara said. I would be too if I came that far. The baby isn't going to wait for her to get strong. No, it's going to kill her, Jolo said. Well, then save it at least, Clara said, feeling so downcast suddenly that she left the room. She got a water bucket and walked out of the house, meaning to get some water for Bob. It was a beautiful morning, light touching the farthest edges of the plains. Clara noticed the beauty and thought it strange that she could still respond to it, tired as she was and with two people dying in her house, perhaps three. But she loved the fine light of the prairie morning. It had resurrected her spirits time after time through the years, when it seemed that dirt and cold and death would crush her. Just to see the light spreading like that, far on toward Wyoming, was her joy. It seemed to put energy into her, make her want to do things. And the thing she wanted most to do was plant flowers, flowers that might bloom in the light. She did plant them, ordering bulbs and seeds from the east. The light brought them up, and then the wind tore them from her. Worse than the dirt, she hated the wind, the dirt she could hold her own with, sweeping it away each morning, but the wind was endless and fierce. It renewed itself again and again, curling out of the north to take her flowers from her, petal by petal, until nothing remained but the sad stalks. Clara kept on planting anyway, hiding the flowers in the most protected spots she could find. The wind always found them, too, in time, but sometimes the blooms lasted a few days before the petals were blown away. It was a battle she wouldn't give up on. Every winter, she read seed catalogs with the girls and described to them the flowers they would have when spring came. Coming back with a bucket from the cistern, she noticed the two dirty, silent men sitting on the wagon. She had walked past them without a thought on her way to the well. Is it born yet? Luke asked. Not yet. Clara said. She's too tired to help much. The large man followed her with his eyes, but said nothing. You've got too much fire in that stove. You'll burn everything, Clara said when she saw how the girls were progressing with breakfast. Oh, Ma, we can cook, Sally said. She loved to get her mother out of the kitchen. Then she could boss her younger sister around. Is that woman real sick? Betsy asked. Why does she yell so much? She's working at a hard task. Clara said. You better not burn that porridge, because I want some. She carried the bucket up to the bedroom, pulled the smelly sheets out from under Bob, and washed him. Bob stared straight up, as he always did. Usually she warmed the water, but this morning she hadn't taken the time. It was cold and raised goosebumps on his legs. His big ribs seemed to stick out more every day. She had forgotten to bring fresh sheets. It was a constant problem, keeping fresh sheets, so she covered him with a blanket and walked out on her porch for a minute. She heard Elmira begin to moan, again and again. 
She had to go relieve Cholo, she knew, but she didn't rush. The birth might take another day. Everything took longer than it should, or else went too quick. Her son's lives had been whipped away like a breath, while her husband had lain motionless for two months and still wasn't dead. It was wearying, trying to adjust to all the paces life required. After she had stood for a moment on the cool porch, she went down the hall, just in time to hold Elmira down and watch Cholo ease a baby boy from her bloodied loins. The baby looked dead, and Elmira looked as if she were dying, but in fact both lived. Cholo held the little boy close to his face and blew on it, until finally the child moved and began to cry, a thin sound not much stronger than a squeak of a mouse. Elmira had passed out, but she was breathing. Clara went downstairs to heat some water and saw that the girls had taken breakfast to the two men. They were standing around while the men ate, not to be denied the novelty of conversation, even if only with two buffalo hunters, one of whom wouldn't talk. It made her want to cry, suddenly, that her children were so devoid of playmates that they would hang around two sullen men just for the excitement of company. She heated the water and let the girls be. Probably the men would go on soon though Luke seemed to be talking to the girls happily. Maybe he was as lonesome as they were. When she went up with the hot water, Elmira was awake, her eyes wide open. She was pale, almost bloodless, no color in her cheeks at all. It's a miracle you got here, Clara said. If you'd had that baby down on the plains, I doubt either one of you would have lived. The old Mexican had wrapped the infant in a flannel robe and brought it to Elmira to see, but Elmira didn't look at it. She didn't speak, and she wouldn't look. She didn't want the baby. Maybe it'll die, she thought. Dee won't want it either. Clara saw the woman turn her eyes away. Without a word, she took the infant from Cholo and walked downstairs with it out into the sunlight. The girls still stood by the wagon, though the men had eaten. She shielded the baby's eyes with a robe and carried it over to the group. Oh, Ma, Betsy said. She had never seen a newborn child. What's its name? The lady's too tired to worry about naming it just now, Clara said. It's a boy, though. It's lucky we got here, ain't it? Luke said. Me and Zway would have had no idea what to do. Yes, it's lucky, Clara said. Big Zway stared at the baby silently for a time. It's red, Luke, he said finally. I guess it's an Indian. Clara laughed. <laughs> it's no Indian, she said. Babies mostly are red. Can I hold it? Sally asked. I helped Betsy. I know how. Clara let her take the child. Cholo had come downstairs and was standing at the back porch, a cup of coffee in his hand. The way he wants to go to town, Luke said. Can Ellie go yet? Oh, no, Clara said. She's had a bad time, and she's weak. It would kill her to travel today. She'll need to rest for about a week. Maybe you could come back for her, or else we could bring her in a little wagon when she gets well. But Zway refused to leave. Ellie had wanted to get to town, he remembered, and he was determined to wait until she could go. He sat in the shade of the wagon all day and taught the two young girls how to play mumbly pick. Clara looked out at them occasionally from the upper windows. There seemed no harm in the man. Luke bored, had ridden off with Cholo to check the mares. When Clara took the child in to nurse, she began to see that Elmira didn't want it. She turned her wide eyes away when Clara brought it near. The infant was whimpering and hungry. Ma'am, it's got a nurse, Clara said. Elmira made no objection when the baby was put to her breast, but the business was difficult. At first no milk would come. Clara began to fear the baby would weaken and die before it could even be fed. Finally, it nursed a little, but the milk didn't satisfy it. An hour later, it was crying in hunger again. Thin milk, Clara thought, and no wonder, for the woman probably hadn't eaten a decent meal in months. She refused to look at the baby, even when it took her breast. Clara had to hold it and encourage it, rubbing its little lips with milk. They say you're married to a sheriff, Clara said, thinking conversation might help. The man might be the cause of her flight, she thought. She probably didn't want him in the first place and hadn't asked for this child. Elmira didn't answer. She didn't want to talk to this woman. Her breasts were so full they hurt, and she didn't care that the baby took the milk. She just didn't want to look at it. 
She wanted to get up and make his way take her to town, to D, but she knew she couldn't do it yet. Her legs were so weak she could hardly move them on the bed. She would never get downstairs unless she crawled. Clara looked at Elmira for a moment and held her peace. It was not a great surprise for her that the woman didn't want the baby. She hadn't wanted Sally, out of fear that she would die. The woman must have her own fears. After all, she had traveled for months across the plains with two buffalo hunters. Perhaps she was fleeing a man. Perhaps looking for a man. Perhaps just running. There was no point in pressing questions, for the woman might not know herself why she ran. Besides, Clara remembered the immense fatigue that had seized her when Betsy was born. Though the last, Betsy, had been the most difficult of her births. And when it was over, she could not lift her head for three hours. To speak took an immense effort, and Almira had had a harder time than she had. Best to just let her rest. When her strength came back, she might not be so ill-disposed toward the child. Clara took the baby downstairs and had the girls watch him while she went outside and killed a pullet. Biggs Way watched silently from the wagon as she quickly wrung the chicken's neck and plucked it and cleaned it. It takes a mess of chicken soup to run this household these days, she said, bringing the chicken back in. They had some broth left, and she heated a little and took it to Elmira. She was startled to find Elmira on her feet, staring out the window. Goodness, you best lay down, Clara said. You've lost blood. We've got to build you up. Elmira obeyed passively. She allowed Clara to feed her a few spoonfuls of the soup. How far's town? she asked. Too far for you to walk or ride either, Clara said. That town isn't going to run away. Can't you just rest for a day or two? Elmira didn't answer. The old man had said that D was a pistolero. Though she didn't care what D was as long as she could find him, the news worried her. Somebody might shoot him before she arrived. He might leave. Might have already left. She couldn't stand the thought. The future had shrunk to one fact. D boot. If she couldn't find him, she meant to kill herself. Clara tried several times during the day to get Elmira interested in the little boy, but with no success. Elmira allowed it to nurse, but that was not successful either. The milk was so weak that the baby would only sleep for an hour and then be hungry again. The girls wanted to know why the baby cried so much. He's hungry, Clara said. I, I can milk the cow early, Sally said. We can give him some of that milk. We may have to, Clara said. We'll have to boil it first. It'll be too rich for him, and the colic will probably kill him, she thought. She carried the helpless little creature herself most of the day, rocking him in her arms and whispering to him. From being red, he had gone to pale, and he was a small baby, not five pounds, she guessed. She herself was very tired. And as the evening drew on and the sun fell, she found herself in a very uneven temper, scolding the girls harshly for their loudness one minute, going out on her porch with the baby, almost in tears herself another. Perhaps it's best that it dies. She doesn't want it, she thought. And then the next moment, the baby's eyes would open for a second and her heart would fill. Then she would reproach herself for her own callousness. When night fell, she went in and lit a lamp in the room where Elmira lay. Clara, seeing that her eyes were open, started to take the baby to her, but once again Elmira turned her head away. "'What's your husband's name?' Clara asked. "'I'm looking for D. Boot,' Elmira said. She didn't want to say July's name. The baby was whimpering, but she didn't care. It was July's, and she didn't want to have anything to do with anything of July's. Clara got the infant to nurse a little and then took it up to her own room to lie down a while. She knew it wouldn't sleep long, but she herself had to sleep and was afraid to trust it with its mother yet. At some point she heard the baby whimpering, but she was too tired to rise. In the back of her mind she knew that she had to get up and feed Bob, but the desire to sleep was too heavy. She couldn't make herself move. Then she felt a hand on her shoulder and saw Cholo kneeling by the bed. What's the matter? Clara asked. They leave, Cholo said. Clara jumped up and ran into the room where Elmira had been. Sure enough, she was gone. She went to the window and could see the wagon north of the corrals. Behind her, she could hear the baby crying. Signora, I couldn't stop them, Cholo said. 
I doubt they'll stop just because you ask. And we don't need any gunfights, Clara said. Let them go. If she lives, she might come back. Did you milk? Cholo nodded. I wish we had a goat, Clara said. I've heard goat's milk is better for babies than cow's milk. If you see any goats next time you go to town, let's buy a couple. Then she grew a little embarrassed. Sometimes she talked to Cholo as if he were her husband and not Bob. She went downstairs, made a fire in the cook stove, and began to boil some milk. When it was boiled, she took it up and gave the baby a little, dipping a cotton rag in the milk and letting the baby suck it. It was a slow method and took patience. The child was too weak to work at it, but she knew if she didn't persist, the baby would only get weaker and die. So she kept on, dribbling milk into its mouth, even when it grew too tired to suck on the rag. I know this is slow, she whispered to it. When the baby had taken all it would, she got up to walk it. It was a nice moonlit night, and she went out on her porch for a while. The baby was asleep, tucked against her breast. You could be worse off, she thought, looking at it. Your mother had pretty good sense. She waited to have you until she got to where there were people who will look after you. Then she remembered that she had not fed Bob. She took the baby down to the kitchen and heated the chicken broth. Think of the work I'd save if everything didn't have to be hot, she said to the infant, who slept on. She laid it at the foot of Bob's bed while she fed her husband, tilting his head so he could swallow. It was strange to her that he could swallow when he couldn't even close his eyes. He was a big man with a big head. Every time she fed him, her wrist ached from supporting his head. I guess we got us a boy, Bob, she said told her to talk to him. They thought it might make a difference, but Clara found that the only difference was that she got depressed. The depressing aspect of it was that it reminded her too clearly of their years together, for she had liked to chatter, and Bob never talked. She had talked at him for years and got no answers. He only spoke if money was concerned. She would talk for two hours, and he would never utter a sentence. So far as conversation went, the marriage was no different than it ever had been. It was just easier for her to have her way about money, something that also struck her as sad. She picked the baby up and held it to her bosom. The thought was in her head that if he saw her with a child, it might make a difference. Bob might see it, think it was theirs, and might startle him back into life again. It was unnatural, she knew, for a mother to leave her child the day after it was born. Of course, children were endless work. They came when you didn't want them and had needs you didn't always want to meet. Worst of all, they died no matter how much you loved them. The death of her own had frozen the hope inside her harder than the wintry ground. Her hopes had frozen hard, and she vowed to keep it that way, and yet she hadn't. The hopes thawed. She had hopes for her girls, and might even come to have them for the baby at her bosom, child of another mother, Weak as it was, and slim though its chances, she liked holding the child to her. I stole you, she thought. I got you, and I didn't even have to go through the pain. Your mother's a fool not to want you, but she's smart to realize you wouldn't have much of a chance with her and those buffalo hunters. It wasn't smartness, though, she thought. The woman just didn't care. She looked down at Bob and saw that the baby had made no difference. He lay as he had, nothing left to him but need. Suddenly, Clara felt angry that the man had been fool enough to think he could break that mare. When both she and Chola had warned him to leave her alone, it made her angry at herself to have lived so long with a horse trader who had no more savvy than that. And there he was, his eyes staring upward, as helpless as the baby. She put the child down again and fed Bob soup until her wrist got tired from holding his head. Then she laid Bob's head back on his pillow and ate the rest of the chicken soup herself.